sometimes on this channel, I think of something like a player, let's just say, Edin Dzeko for the purpose of this thought exercise, I think he's underrated, then you know what? I actually think he might be one of the most underrated footballers of the modern era. And then, hmm, there's an idea. And eventually that turns into something like the seven most underrated footballers of the modern era, which I uploaded just last week. Occasionally, however, I have an idea like that one, think I've struck gold, and it turns out that there really aren't many other players like the one that I've got in my head. This is one of those instances. Just before Christmas, I saw a player who features in this seven described as a Chelsea flop, and I thought that seemed a bit harsh. That got me thinking about other players who have been harshly or just flat out wrongly labelled as flops, which I thought would make for a great video. But, I will level with you, most of the players widely considered to have been massive disappointments and terrible signings, well, they were, basically. It's hard to spin the more than £100 million signing of Eden Hazard by Real Madrid on £400,000 a week as he proceeded to spend most of the next four years out injured before retiring at 32 and only scored seven goals in 76 games even when fit as anything other than a catastrophic failure. The same goes for the likes of Romelu Lukaku at Chelsea, Danny Drinkwater at Chelsea and Kepra Ariza Balaga also at Chelsea, and probably, if I gave it a bit more thought, even some players who weren't signed by Chelsea. Andrei Shevchenko, for example. Uh, oh no, hang on. Mikhailo Mudrik? Oh, never mind. Forget I ever said anything. There are some examples out there, though, and Chelsea are an interesting case in point. You would struggle to find too many players who are more ubiquitously considered to be flops than Alvaro Morata at Stamford Bridge, but was he really all that bad? And before you say, yes, Alfie, of course he was, just hear me out. Morata scored 24 goals in 72 games for Chelsea, averaging one goal every 179 minutes. Compare that with every Chelsea striker that has followed him. Timo Werner, a goal every 263 minutes. Romelu Lukaku, 214 minutes. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, 320 minutes. Joao Felix, 297 minutes. And Chelsea's current centre-forward, Nicholas Jackson, who has so far bagged a goal once every 216 minutes. And it becomes clear that Morata is actually, quite comfortably in fact, the most prolific centre-forward that Chelsea have had for the best part of a decade. That's not to say that he was brilliant, of course, otherwise he would make the seven rather than just being alluded to in the introduction, just that he wasn't that bad, and was perhaps more of a victim of the fact that he was brought in to replace Diego Costa, who, especially at that time, was just a completely different profile of centre-forward rather than any flaws of his own. Morata doesn't quite make the cut, but another much maligned former Chelsea centre-forward does, so without further ado, who was genuinely a flop everywhere that he went post-DC United at least, here are seven footballers who are labelled as flops, but were either not that bad or actually quite good. Seventh, Eric Lamella at Tottenham Hotspur. Eric Lamella at Tottenham is a funny one, because you would be hard pushed to find many Spurs fans who would label him a flop, but outside of Tottenham, that perception is practically universal. One of seven players signed by Spurs in the summer of 2013 for a combined total of in excess of £100 million, following the sale of Gareth Bale to Real Madrid, it would be fair to say that window is not reflected upon too kindly more than a decade on. In fact, outside of Christian Eriksen, who was signed for £11.5 million from Ajax, all of Tottenham's signings, most notably Roberto Soldado and Paulinho, were considered to fall somewhere between underwhelming and disastrous. Spurs broke their own spending record three times in that window alone, and Lamella, signed for a potential £30 million from Roma, was the most expensive of the lot. Lamella was lumbered with two unenviable tags during his late teens and early 20s, namely the next Messi at Roma and Gareth Bale's replacement at Spurs. In that respect, if indeed you set the bar that high, then of course Lamella was a flop, and he was always destined to be one. If you strip away all of the noise, however, history looks a little bit kinder upon the Argentine. 
He endured a difficult start to life in North London, seemingly zapped of all of his confidence, and after just one goal and four assists in his opening 17 appearances, Lamella picked up a back injury, which ruled him out for the rest of his debut campaign. Perhaps some people wrote Lamella off at that stage, and he never produced the kind of consistently spectacular form required to shift that perception. But over the next few years, he certainly endeared himself to Spurs fans. The type of player that you love on your own team, but can't stand if they play for anyone else, Lamella was an unusual profile of a flair player who played predominantly out wide, while also being a bit nasty and a complete and utter house. I'm not saying this is necessarily a good thing, but there haven't been many players both willing and able to stamp on Cesc Fabregas or get Anthony Martial sent off, and then nutmeg three players or score a Pushkash award-winning Rabona all in the same game. Lamella was that man though, and as frustrating as he was at times, his sheer perseverance saw him stick around at Tottenham for eight whole seasons, scoring 37 goals and making 47 assists, in 257 games. So, Lamella was neither Messi nor Bale, nor did he ever, or was he ever likely, to come close to either of them. But if he was truly a flop, he wouldn't have stuck around for eight years, he wouldn't have made over 250 appearances, and he wouldn't hold such a special place in Spurs fans' hearts. Sixth, Michael Owen at Real Madrid. Michael Owen is a fascinating character, somehow managing to simultaneously appear to be incredibly simple and, in truth, dense, whilst also being remarkably complex and trickier to dissect than the Enigma Code. The monotone, book-dodging, apple-tossing, helicopter-flying, horse-riding, Dubai-gazing and dart-throwing mystery, who still gives 13-year-old goalkeepers nightmares with his dead-eyed finishing, is undeniably one of football's strangest characters, while maintaining a reputation for being mind-numbingly dull. You can say what you want about Owen, and there is an awful lot to be said, but it would be absurd to question his talents as a player. The greatest teenage footballer England has produced in at least the last 50 years, yes, better than Wayne Rooney or Jude Bellingham, and it isn't even close. Owen won two Premier League Golden Boots before he'd even turned 20, and a Ballon d'Or, aged 22 and 4 days. Lightning quick, able to contribute in all phases, and a fantastic goal scorer. Owen is often viewed as having peaked young, being crippled by injuries, and having become much less effective in his later years. And all of those things are true. Even when he won his Ballon d'Or at 22, for the football that he played at 21, Owen was already past his very best. Three years later, Owen joined Real Madrid, where he is routinely portrayed as having been a terrible signing and an enormous flop, but I think that's a bit of a myth. Owen joined a Real Madrid team that had just finished fourth in La Liga, despite the presence of fellow Galacticos like Figo, Beckham and Zidane, so this wasn't a settled environment that he walked into. Owen, likewise, never settled in Madrid, still aged only 24, with a wife and a one-year-old child living, for the first four months at least, in a hotel room. So personally and privately, Owen's move to Madrid was a struggle, and it's no surprise that it didn't last. But on the pitch, though already past his peak, Owen was still excellent. He scored 16 goals and made 4 assists in 45 appearances, playing as both a 9 and as a 10, averaging a goal contribution once every 122 minutes when he was on the pitch, including a goal in El Clasico. Owen outscored Real Madrid legend Raul Gonzalez that season, who played 1,000 more minutes than him, and indeed, every single Real Madrid player barring Ronaldo, who had an identical record in terms of minutes per goal. If that is flopping, then about 99.9% .9 of footballers can only ever dream of being such emphatic flops. Madrid also rose from 4th to 2nd place with Owen, and they were much worse the following season after he had departed. When Real Madrid did sell Owen to Newcastle United after a single season, they did so for over twice as much as they paid for him. So Michael Owen is many things, but neither a Real Madrid flop nor a terrible signing for Los Blancos as far as I'm concerned. Fifth, Samir Nasri at Manchester City. I'll be honest, before researching this video, I didn't even realise that this was such a commonly held view. If you look at pretty much any article in the English press about Nasri, though, he's never presented as 41-cap French international Samir Nasri, 
former League One and Premier League Team of the Year inclusion, Samir Nasri, or two-time Premier League title winner, Samir Nasri. No, almost without fail, he is Man City flop Samir Nasri. Even then, I thought that might just be an English tabloid press thing, you know, like racism and hacking murder children's telephones, but having put a few feelers out there, it would seem as though it's actually a fairly commonly held view. Don't get me wrong, Nasri isn't in the same bracket of post-2008 Manchester City midfielder as Yaya Torre, David Silva, Bernardo Silva, or obviously Kevin De Bruyne, but nor was he a Jack Rodwell, Javi Garcia, or Calvin Phillips. Nasri was one of four players to transfer directly from Arsenal to Manchester City within just a few years, along with Colo Torre, Emmanuel Adebayor, and Gael Cliche, as the Citizens utilised their newfound Emirati wealth to devastating effect. I actually think Adebayor, a fellow arrival from Arsenal, is sometimes wrongly labelled as a flop at Manchester City as well. Albeit he arrived for £25 million, it would be wrong to brand Adebayor a dud. He scored 14 goals in 26 Premier League matches in his only full season at the Etihad, which is a more than decent return. And it was bettered only by Carlos Tevez that season, as Man City climbed from 10th to 5th place, in no small part thanks to him. Anyway, I digress, but Nazari's contribution was even greater than Adebayor's. In his debut campaign, the Frenchman made 45 appearances, scored 6 goals, and made 9 assists, playing a key role in Man City's first top flight league title in 44 years. When they won their second in 2013-14 under Manuel Pellegrini, Nasri was even more integral, this time making 23 goal contributions in 46 games, as well as winning the Man of the Match award in the League Cup final at Wembley, which saw the Citizens win their first ever League and Cup double. In total, Nasri played 176 games for Man City, scored 27 goals, made 40 assists, and was key to both of their first two title wins of the Mansoura era. Which feels like a really depressing phrase. Either way, not a flop by any means. Fourth, Neymar at PSG. Probably the most controversial inclusion in this seven, if you argue that a flop is anyone who falls short of expectations, and that the expectation of Neymar at PSG was explicitly that he would guide them to their first Champions League crown, and therefore win the Ballon d'Or, then, definitionally I suppose, he has to be considered a flop. As with Lamella, however, albeit to a slightly lesser degree given Neymar's price tag and abilities, I'm not convinced that that is a reasonable way in which to assess someone, even someone of Neymar's calibre. There is a perception that Neymar peaked at Barcelona, where he was pretty much universally, at one stage at least, considered to be the third best footballer in the world, behind Messi and Ronaldo. And then he regressed at PSG, was never as good, and that's why he now finds himself in Saudi Arabia. The reality, however, is that in terms of his performances, ability, and actually his output, Neymar peaked in Paris. Purely in terms of the numbers, Neymar scored 118 goals and made 77 assists in 173 games for PSG, averaging a goal contribution once every 74 minutes. That really is Messi and Ronaldo territory, and even if you add on some league tax, Neymar was just as productive in the Champions League. Neymar's real problem in Paris wasn't his performances, attitude, or ability, but rather his availability, as the remarkable amount of first-team football that he played in his teens and early 20s finally caught up with him, and Neymar never played more than 31 games in a season in Paris, and no more than a meagre 22 in Ligue 1. That's a bit of an issue when you pay 222 million euros for someone, don't get me wrong, but something about calling someone who, when fit, was consistently one of the best players on the planet for six years, just doesn't quite sit right with me. It would be like calling Ronaldo a flop at Inter Milan, or Gareth Bale at Real Madrid because they were injured a lot, or Alan Shearer at Newcastle United because, despite arriving for a world record-breaking fee, he couldn't inspire them to a Premier League title, or any trophies for that matter. It almost feels like if PSG had won the 2020 Champions League final, instead of losing it 1-0 against Bayern Munich, no one would consider Neymar a flop. And though football is a game of fine margins, I can't quite get on board with that. 
What's more, though Neymar cost PSG a world record breaking 222 million euros, they sold him after six years of service for 90 million euros, and a net cost of 132 million euros puts him in the same price bracket as the likes of Joao Felix and Philippe Coutinho, who both did far less for Atletico Madrid and Barcelona than Neymar did for PSG. Third, Zlatan Ibrahimovic at Barcelona. Despite playing for nine different clubs over a career spanning an incredible 24 years, Zlatan Ibrahimovic is considered an emphatic success for every single one of them, with just one exception. The exception came at Barcelona, who Ibrahimovic joined in 2009 for what I have long contested, though it's not exactly a hill that I'm willing to die on, was probably, technically speaking, a world record-breaking fee. Inter Milan initially demanded a fee of in excess of 80 million euros for Ibrahimovic, who scored 29 goals in 47 games the previous season, which would have fallen just short of the fee that Real Madrid paid for Cristiano Ronaldo later that week. In the end, Inter accepted 69.5 million euros, plus Samueletto, who was rumoured to be valued at 20 million euros. That alone would make Ibrahimovic the most expensive footballer of all time in 2009, but even 20 million euros for Eto seems low, given the fact that he scored 36 goals, so more than Ibrahimovic, in 52 games in a treble winning Barcelona team the previous season, and was still only 28 years old. The narrative that is told about Ibrahimovic is that he was very expensive, didn't fit in at Barca, failed to perform at the same level as he did everywhere else, and was sold for a significant loss. That is, let's just say, 75% true. Ibrahimovic was indeed very expensive, he didn't fit in at Barca or get along with Pep Guardiola, and he was sold for a significant loss. But when he actually played, he performed at pretty much the exact same level and scored a similar number of goals as he did everywhere else. Prolific and technically gifted, despite his size, Ibrahimovic seemed like the ideal number 9 for Pep Guardiola, whose relationship with Samuel Eto had soured. Guardiola has never liked big personalities though, at least not when those personalities have come into conflict with his own. He's all about the balance of a squad in control, and Ibrahimovic, who famously refused to turn up to training in his club car, provided by Barca sponsors Audi, but in a 3 million euro Ferrari instead, put all of that at risk. As the 2009-10 season went on, Guardiola also felt as though he could get the best out of Lionel Messi by playing him centrally, and Messi agreed. That left Ibrahimovic without an obvious role, and unlike someone like Thierry Henry, who had been the star man elsewhere but was happy to make sacrifices for Guardiola and understood that Messi would be the main man, Ibrahimovic appeared unwilling to adapt. That's why his time in Catalonia was cut so short, but on the pitch, it's a little bit absurd to suggest that he was a flop. In 46 games at the Camp Nou, Zlatan scored 22 goals and made 13 assists, a record made all the more impressive by the fact that many of those appearances weren't starts. Overall, Ibrahimovic averaged a goal contribution once every 95 minutes, which is a record that most players can only dream of ever achieving. I think the fact that Barca lost in the Champions League semi-finals that season to Inter, and Samuel Eto went on to win the competition after being the lesser party in that deal, and Ibrahimovic subsequently departed after a single season, contributed to the narrative that he wasn't very good at the camp now. In reality, Ibrahimovic was as good as ever, but like always, he played for himself, which didn't suit Guardiola, and his biggest crime, ultimately, was simply that he wasn't as good as Lionel Messi. And if that makes you a flop, there might not have been a single other player in history who wasn't one. Second, Angel Di Maria at Manchester United. I've said this before multiple times on this channel in other contexts, so long-term viewers and subscribers won't be surprised to hear me say it once again, but Angel Di Maria really wasn't that bad at Manchester United. Di Maria joined the Red Devils after the season of his life, in which he made 52 appearances as Real Madrid won the Champions League, and was probably Argentina's second best player in their run to the final of the 2014 World Cup. 
there was a general sense of amazement among football fans, therefore, that Real Madrid were willing to sell him. Though he was a winger by trade, the arrival of Gareth Bale and the continued presence of Cristiano Ronaldo had left Di Maria's place at the Bernabeu in doubt the previous summer. He overcame that, particularly in the second half of the season, by starring in a more central role, and there were no doubts in Madrid as to Di Maria's talents. But having signed fellow World Cup stars Tony Kroos and James Rodriguez, who both played centrally, Di Maria was deemed expendable if the price was right. The price that Manchester United paid was just shy of £60 million, setting a new British record transfer fee at the time. Once again, it seemed as though the fee and sense of anticipation had turned Di Maria into something that he wasn't in people's eyes. Because he had cost more than Alexis Sanchez at Arsenal that summer, and almost as much as Luis Suarez's move to Barcelona, there was an expectation that Di Maria was going to be a routine match winner and a prolific goalscorer, despite the fact that he had never really been either of those things. The previous season had been Di Maria's most prolific of his career, in which he scored 11 goals, only four of them in La Liga. In his only season at Old Trafford, Di Maria bagged four goals and 12 assists in significantly fewer games, just 32, notching a goal contribution once every 125 minutes, despite never having a settled position in Louis van Gaal's starting 11, which put him joint third in that season's Premier League assist charts, trailing only Cesc Fabregas and Santi Carzola. I thought Di Maria was one of Manchester United's best players that season, and though he didn't live up to expectations that he would be someone else, he was a perfectly decent version of himself. As with Ibrahimovic, Di Maria departed after a single season for a roughly £15 million loss, joining PSG, where he was once again outstanding. First, Hernan Crespo at Chelsea. The man who inspired this seven, before I realised that there weren't quite as many other examples as I had initially hoped, Hernan Crespo, you may be surprised to discover, actually spent five years contracted to Chelsea. I say you might be surprised because, despite that fact, he only actually spent two seasons playing for the Blues, and the first of those was plagued by injuries. Crespo was probably the biggest name among Chelsea's raft of arrivals in the summer of 2003, which was Roman Abramovich's first window in charge, in what is still the highest spending window of all time when adjusted for football-specific inflation. One of the most prolific goalscorers in Serie A for the last seven years, at a time in which he was considered the world's toughest division, and a particularly difficult one in which to score goals, Crespo set Chelsea back almost £17 million. Younger viewers are just going to have to take my word for it that that was a lot of money back then, rather than the amount of money that a team like Chelsea would throw at a third-choice goalkeeper. Though Crespo was ravaged by injuries in his debut campaign, and utterly miserable off the pitch, as he found it so difficult adjusting to life in England that he contemplated an early retirement from the sport, he still managed to score 10 goals in 19 Premier League matches, and 12 in 32 in all competitions. Crespo's West London despair led to a loan move to AC Milan, where he fell back in love with the sport, scoring two goals in the 2005 Champions League final, though that still wasn't enough, to prevent a remarkable Liverpool comeback. Crespo desperately sought a permanent move to Milan that summer, but the two clubs were unable to agree upon a fee. As such, Crespo found himself back at the bridge, this time under Jose Mourinho rather than Claudio Ranieri. The issue this time around wasn't so much a personal one as a personnel one. Namely, the fact that Chelsea had signed Didier Drogba the previous summer, and he was Jose Mourinho's main man in a system which involved only one up top. Nonetheless, Crespo still chipped in with 13 goals and 4 assists from limited minutes as Chelsea won the Premier League title. In total, Crespo notched a goal contribution once every 132 minutes at Chelsea, and in the Premier League, he was actually more prolific in terms of minutes per goal than Didier Drogba. Was he Chelsea's best ever signing? Clearly not. Was he worth the money? Probably not. Was he a flop? Not in my book. Crespo was a world-class centre-forward whose time at Chelsea was disrupted by injuries, off-field issues, and a difficulty dislodging Didier Drogba, but he still routinely illustrated his tremendous talent almost any time that he took to the pitch. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much, as I'm for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course, 
goes without saying, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel and my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at hitc 7 on all three, should you wish to do so. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more good stuff, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.